uh, I wasn't quite convinced. I really want, <laughs> which is always a reason for uh, concern, or when you want something to be a certain way when you're doing an, an experiment. Um, but anyway, I wanted, I wanted, so you can see up at the top of the screen here, the output, graphical output from processing. And I have my EMF detector here, and then I have my two nodes here. So, um, of different size, here's a shorter one and here's a taller one. This one definitely outputs more. <coughs> but it's, I'm not super concerned that they be the exact same output. I, as I'll explain shortly, I am concerned that their phase is relatively in sync um, for certain reasons, which I'll, again I'll go into later. But anyway, my concern was is that what I want to happen is to have sort of the, the, the outlier here be, be much lower, and then as I come in, to the node, to one node, that it comes higher, and that as I come in between the two nodes, that it goes a little lower, and then to the other node goes higher, and then outside the other node goes lower. But that, but importantly, I wanted this area in the middle of the two nodes to be higher than the same distance outside of the node. So in other words, I wanted the fields to superimpose. And according to theory, it should be that way. Um, but I was concerned because I was getting, you know, experiments are always about repeatability, and I was repeating and last night, and it was just getting spurious results. Um, I was even getting some crazy capacitive, co just straight capacitive sensing, which I'm not getting. I don't know why I was getting it, but I was getting some amazing, some really strong just capacitive sensing. Um, so anyway, I was wondering if that was interfering. Um, then also what I did was, is I was concerned that I was um, having the two nodes from two different 555 timers, that if they're out of phase, they would deconstructively interfere um, and therefore not create a superimposed field here. Um, so what I did was, is I just took the output from one of the timers, one of the oscillators, and fed it into both antenna. Um, I, I can't rightly say that it, it made an appreciable difference, um, but I think what's really happening, why, why I was getting some different results, because a couple days ago, I, I think, uh, well, the last video for the main experiment, it was showing really pretty good differentiation. In other words, right now they're only two inches apart, but when they were six inches apart, I could really see it It start, let me make sure I'm in frame here, um, could really, you really start low on the outside of the two nodes and then come up to one node and then drop down between them, but never drop down lower than the outside. Again, the same distance away from the middle. I know that's kind of co confusing, but um, the point being is, is that I wanted to show that if a node alone had a certain electromagnetic field, say two inches away on either side, that if I added a node four inches away, that that, that two inches now between the nodes, so that if you're measuring in between the nodes, that that would be higher, the electromagnetic field would be higher than if you were on the outside two inches away um, whether you have, you know, two, two nodes or, or just one. So again, uh, the point being is that uh, the fields superimpose. And, you know, I checked. <laughs> it's, it's been a while since I've taken physics back in the day. So I checked my Giancoli. And um, page 514, I'll just put this here for reference. I, I'm sure this isn't legible, but 514, the point being is that, yes, in fact, here it is. Uh, then the electric field E at any point is obtained by summing over all the infinitesimal contributions, which is the integral. E equals integral of infinitesimal, you know, E. So each infinitesimal contribution along here will contribute to a point P here. And so I made, you know, the leap that, that this too would then contribute to point P. Um, 
And so I, I still feel I'm correct in that. That, um, but anyway, I was still getting results that that weren't quite because I was expecting this to be twice as high in the middle here than the same distance to the outside. Um, but you know, there's there's kind of a noise floor that could be a factor. But also, I discovered another factor that's perhaps common sense to some. But um, yeah, I'm grounding, so you can watch. You can see the the EMF drop detector. Um, but anyway, the, I think um, a large factor is the fact that, quite simply, that what's happening is that when I'm out here on the outside of the system, the, two, the pair of nodes, I'm still getting contribution from this far node. And I did test it where I took one of the nodes out and I just had one node and I said, okay, well, how far can I discern here the electromagnetic field? And sure enough, I could discern the electromagnetic field um, significantly farther than than the, the midpoints, which would between the two, when I put the node back between the new, two nodes. So if they're just two inches apart, then one inch being the middle, um, so one inch from either either node, is still well within. Um, uh, if I'm on the outside again one inch from any one node on the outside of the pair is still within the influence from the far node. In other words, three inches away, um, you're still receiving influence fr uh, from the, the, the far, no far node. Um, and so that would, that would account for the fact that if I go in the middle here, uh, I have this much. So you can see it tracing now. And I can also see why, uh, I forget who it was, it, I'll have to check um, who did the averaging array, but you can see why that might be useful. Um, it's definitely pretty spiked. Really part of it is, is that I moved the nodes closer. I mean, they're two inches away now. So I'll put a sketch in the, um, uh, on, the, on the webpage for this little sub-sub experiment um, to, to describe how the, the two fields can over overlap. And that as they get closer, you're going to lose you're going to lose some um, distinction between them. Um, I think uh, what I'll do now is try and uh, se I'll, s I'll separate them a little bit to make it a little more distinct. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. So now I moved them so that they're four inches apart now, and um, the it is in fact more distinct. Um, in other words, I can discern both each of the nodes. And the fact that the the field in between them it it, it does superimpose. Um, so here I am in the middle. Let's establish this. Um, and now I'll move t towards one node. And as they're four inches apart, middle would be two inches. So now I'm moving two inches away. on the outside and sure enough we can see that it's appreciably smaller than than the um, the area before I moved closer to the node so in the area right before I moved closer to the node I was in the middle of the two nodes it had a certain level and then I came closer to the node it had a higher level and then I was two inches outside the system and it dropped down below uh, the level when I was in the middle so that's, that's um, just repeating the experiment, I suppose, because that's, that's what I concluded before. And uh, it was a good exercise, actually. Uh, it helped me refine, you know, distances. So just to show <clears throat> how one node's distribution can contribute to the, the outside of the double node system, um, here I am with the shorter node, less powerful node, um, and here's its level. And as I move away, you know, drops. Now I'm at four inches where the other node was. Moving out. Now importantly, here I am at six inches. Now this is where I'd be measuring to compare um, the, the middle of the two nodes to 
which is two inches away from each node, to the outside of the system, which is two inches away from the far node. So now as I keep going, see it dropping 10 inches, 12, and on down. So it is the case that there's a significant contribution from um, the far node, even when you're on the outside of, of what I'll call the near node. Um, and that's really quite fascinating. <laughs> um, I'll just show it again. So that, that's the reason why it, it, there's sort of a precipitous, a more precipitous drop. When I have the two nodes, and again, here's where the other node would be. I'm still getting a significant input from the first node just by itself. Um, and then here's, again, the six inches. So this electromagnetic field would also be contributing to what the second node, if it were here, would be contributing to the outside of the system. Uh, so another thing that's really critical, probably almost as critical, just for functionality, for implementation, I should say, is I've just sort of placed it in the middle here, and it's going to be kind of a stretching game because what I want to show, and I've claimed this before, but I just I just want to illustrate it again because it really is fundamental. Before I move forward, let me ground the situation here. Um, so I just want to demonstrate, hopefully I can reach my power supply. So what I'm doing is so I'm in the middle now. What I'm, do what I'm doing is I'm at 10 volts input now and I've typically been as high as 14. Um, but I'm going to drop the voltage now and look at that. That is awesome. Very, very immediate response, raising the voltage, going up, and it'll you know pretty much tap out over 10, 10 volts of input given this setting. And again, I have three different settings for sensitivity of the EMF detector. I'm in the medium setting right now. Um, but so the voltage is, you know, so I'm in the medium setting, and so I need to adjust the voltage so that it maxes out you know, right, right about, you know, because I got my 255 height, and hopefully I'm not blocking that, I'll wait till it traces a bit, um, but uh, anyway, in order to, the whole point is that the distinctness of a distribution, the distribution of the electromagnetic field, as the system, you know, I make the system more complex and it becomes more dynamic, I need to, I need to be able to um, discern uh, distinct activity of nodes and, and assemblies of nodes and so if the voltage is if the if the setting for whatever reason the system is very sensitive um, and as as people will agree analog is is rather messy I need some some uh, feedback to be able to adjust the system so that I can maintain um, you know, maximum reading, but at the same time that it doesn't, you know, again, if I come, so for example, if I come all the way, you know, here, it's just going to, it's just going to tap out, and that's not helpful. But perhaps there can be an algorithm that could sense that and then lower the voltage after, after it, um, it's sort of like an automatic debugging. If, if it's, if it's totally, if it's totally, uh, what's the term, like um, tapping out uh, up at, up top for a certain length of time, perhaps I can come up with an algorithm that's sampling that and then uh, on the fly lower the voltage so that I can get some discernment in the system, uh, the ability to distinguish uh, the topography. So I don't, I don't think I finished my, my point about, um, you know, controlling my environment. Um, so I, I switched to my, my big breadboard and here and, um, and I pulled away from, because I, I was getting interference from uh, all the resistors and everything that were constituting the oscillators for each 555 timer, realizing that they were potentially making me think that I was getting superposition in between, 
the two nodes when in fact I might have just been reading off the resistors and in fact when I do when I did put the oscilloscope on the resistors um, they they certainly do have uh, some semblance of, of a signal I mean it's not a square wave but it's in the process of becoming a square wave um, so I moved it to the breadboard so I can isolate the antennas but then I ran into the additional problem if I used a bus line as a power supply in between the two nodes um, then it itself it becomes an, an emitter um, so what I did is I just I used the far bus line uh, and again like I said before I just I'm just using one one um, oscillator which actually might make my implementation easier because I I don't see why I can't just use one oscillator for you know many nodes um, but anyway um, and then instead of using a bus line closer I, as I said I, I moved it over here and then I ran a line direct to each each node um, so that at the very least you know they may contribute a little bit as I move I move closer to a single node um, but you know they're 90 degrees and they're you know they're orthogonal um, both to the the antenna and to the receiver so um, it definitely seems to have alleviated some some of the spurious electromagnetic radiation here.